So we'll go ahead and get started, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I am, ha I feel like I'm having a great intimate chat with like seven of my closest friends because that's all I can see. And uh, yet I see the numbers scrolling up on our ticker. So thank you everyone from joining us. We are here at a small town murder. Does it have to be in England? On the airlines, they would say, if this is not your flight, get off. And I'm gonna say, if this is not your flight, stay on and skip whatever panel you were thinking to tune into. Um, I do want to mention that there is a chat box and that's where the questions will go. I will try to keep my eye a little bit on chat as we go through, but it would be nice if maybe you, you hold your question and put it at the end. We're probably a little bit less liable to accidentally skip it. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, it is uh, kind of a, a unique situation that we are here at BoucherCon this year. Um, thank you everyone who's organized. I know it's been a kind of a special effort uh, to get through all the, the little things that we don't normally have to do. Thank you panelists for um, coming and for all the attendees for, for sticking with the Zoom world this year. Um, I'm gonna do a real quick intro just to say hello to everyone. And then we're gonna turn it right around and, and go back to all of you and let you talk a little bit more about your own autobiography in terms of your work. So we're gonna do a little double intro. I'll, I'll call the first one the lightning round. Um, and that way some of your, the readers out there who may not necessarily know you by your face can start to put that face together with the books they've read or the names they know. Um, I'm gonna go in reverse order. My mother's maiden name started with a Y. She said she was always last. So I try to remember that. So we're gonna start with Iona. Um, and based in Vancouver, Iona Wishwa is, it worked, at a youth, worked as a youth worker, social worker, teacher, and award-winning high school principal. She received her master's in creative writing from the University of British Columbia and has published short fiction, poetry, poetry in translation, and one children's book. Her seventh Lane Winslow mystery hit the book stands in April. So welcome, Iona. Thank you. Uh, Delighted to be here. Sherry Randall. Where's Sherry? I'm right there. <laughs> you know, everybody keeps moving around, I think, <laughs> on my screen. I'm like, wait, she used to be there. <laughs> it is the author of the Lobster, Strack, Lobster Shack Mystery Series from St. Martin's Press, the first in the series, Curses Boiled Again, won an Agatha Award for Best First Novel. A librarian and literacy advocate, Sherry is the library liaison for Sisters in Crime. Sherry loves garage sales, dancing, getting takeout for dinner, and visiting her globe-trotting children. Probably not so glove trotting these days, but that'll come back again. Exactly, yeah. um, Susan Shea loves a good mystery so much that she has written five already. The Danny O'Rourke Mysteries and two set in rural France. She served on the National Board of Sisters in Crime and is a past president and member of the NorCal chapter of SEEK. She's also a member of the Mystery Writers of America. She blogs at seven, that's the number seven, Criminal Minds, and her website features French recipes and more, and we'll get back to the French part later. Stephanie Gale is the Pushcart Prize nominated author of the Thomas Lynch Mystery Series. Her first novel, My Summer of Southern Discomfort, was chosen as one of Red Book's top 10 summer reads. She co-founded the popular Boston reading series, Craft on Draft, and she's the current vice president of the National Board of Sisters in Crime. I'm membership liaison for Sisters in Crime. This is starting to feel like a little gathering here. <laughs> uh, Alice K. Boatwright is the author of the Ellie Kent Mysteries, as well as literary fiction, her first mystery, Under, Under an English Heaven, won the 2016 Mystery and Mayhem Grand Prize and has generated a strong following for the series. The third book, In the Life Ever After, will be out in early 2021. And last but not least, her last name starts with an A. I'm sure you're first always, Kathy, so you can yes. last one yes. little time. <laughs> um, her Kate Morgan Mysteries features a Welsh-Canadian professor of criminal psychology. And it's been optioned by Free at Last TV, which produces the Agatha Raisin TV series. She also writes the Wise Inquiry Agency Mysteries. Her standalone, The Wrong Boy, became a number one international bestseller on Amazon and has also been optioned for TV. She's been listed for the Boney Blythe Award three times in four years, winning in 2015, has won an Ippy Award, and was shortlisted for an Author Ellis Award. She now lives on five rural acres in British Columbia, where she's able to work full time as an author and enjoy her other great passion, gardening. Um, I have a black thumb, so I appreciate that. Every time I see my plants that are still alive, oh. I feel some sort of like <laughs> weird happiness. I'm like, how did they make it through? Um, let's cycle back the other way and start with you, Kathy. So this is the kind of, um, you know, how does your autobiography figure into your writing? And you're from Wales, 
you moved to Canada when you said, I think when you were about 40 and you've created a Welsh Canadian protagonist for your Kate Morgan series. Your latest series features protagonists who are, they're a group, Welsh, English, and Scottish. So kind of bringing together the United Kingdom. So, you know, how does that all figure into it? And what do you sift through when you create your books? Well, part of my background is also as a psychologist. And when I started writing, I knew that I wanted the psychology of the characters whether they are the protagonists or the antagonists, to play a great role in what I was writing. And what I've also realized as I get older, you, you know what it's like when you're 40, you think you, you realize you don't even know all the questions, let alone all the answers, which is what we all think we do when we're about 20. So I realized that what I'd learned growing up needed to play into the characters I was writing. So yes, all my main characters, Kate Morgan and the four women of the Wise Inquiries Agency, as you say, one is Welsh, one is Irish, one is Scottish, one is English. They are all British because I grew up and was made in Britain. And that base psychology is something that plays into all of the, all of the protagonists, really, wherever in the world they're operating, because Kate's books are each in a different country and the wise women are all in Wales. So the way that my birth and my growth played into it would be that way. But then my profession was traveling around the world, training managers to become better managers. So I traveled continuously. I lived out of a suitcase for many years. So that's why I sent Kate from country to country to country, because the armchair travel thing is important to me. It, these days, particularly, how great is it to get out and travel through a book? But for me, I, I met so many wonderful people and learned so much about so many great places that I wanted to bring that through in the books as well. So being Welsh, growing up in the UK and then traveling a great deal, pretty much always being an outsider everywhere I went. All of those things have played into Kate and the wise women, I think, and, and then particularly into The Wrong Boy, which is much more psychological suspense than a, than a whodunit. So those would be the aspects, I think, that play into it overall. A lot of good stuff. And for all of the Irish out there, I did not leave out the Irish character no. on purpose. You know, nobody send me a note about that. It was an <laughs> interesting mistake. <laughs> It's like when we get little notes for our writing, you're like, oh no. Um, Alice, let's go to you next. Um, you were an expat in Oxfordshire for at least for some time. I don't know how long exactly. I should have found that out. Um, and your Ellie Kent series features a protagonist who lives in a village in the Cotswolds. Um, so you actually are the one who would make the argument for, yes, it should all happen in an English village, right? You know. Um, so how did your experience lay, uh, kind of lay the groundwork for your decision about setting? Well, I, I think I was an, uh, an Anglophile from a really early age because my uh, family used to go to an English folk dance and folk music camp in the summertime. So I learned how to Morris dance when I was eight years old and I just fell heavily into that whole Thing. So much later in life when I got to live in the Cotswolds where there are villages with unbroken traditions of Morris dancing going back centuries, I felt like I was right at home. But um, I think one of the things that you find when you're an expat is that you're feeling like you're right at home and your environment's view of you are not always exactly the same. <laughs> So uh, we lived in a wonderful village. People were very friendly. We had a great experience there. Um, but we were always the Americans. And you know, I think the whole issue of like what it's like to be an immigrant is a very important one these days. Um, and I love playing with that. And I, I would not have chosen to write an English protagonist. I really, I feel like part of my armchair travel is I bring you in to show you the exotic differences in language that you will fall over uh, as an American when you come into England and you think you're speaking the same language with those people and you are not. And uh, so there are lots of things like that that Ellie Kent experiences and, and my series is focusing on her first year there. So that whole adjustment as part of the whole series. Um, Stephanie, your series is set in Connecticut. 
So armchair traveling, maybe not as far away as some other people, although with a worldwide audience for a lot of people, Connecticut is an incredibly exotic, distant place. It's actually pretty far from me. Um, so what, what you know, caused you to, to come to Connecticut in, in, uh, in your writing? Mm, I'm going to anger people from Connecticut right now. So uh, when I was in my 20s, early 20s, I lived in New York City. Um, and then I, I moved back to Massachusetts, but there was sort of a feeling in your twenties in New York city that people who went to Connecticut were older and had either like had very successful city jobs that they commuted to or had settled. And so, um, I moved chief Lynch from New York city and he's gay, uh, to this very small town in Connecticut in the late 1990s where he's going to be extremely uncomfortable, but also where quite frankly, there aren't enough out people because um, it's a small town in Connecticut. So like, what is his scene going to be? So largely I did it for tension reasons, um, but also for the idea that poor Chief Lynch is like, I've moved to Connecticut. <laughs> it's not a good thing. I mean, it's always the outsider insider, right? I mean, whether yeah. it's Connecticut yeah. or whether it's the backwoods of Australia or something, you know, it's outsider insider. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Susan, we'd love to hear about your outsider insider. You have written um, books set on the West Coast where you're located and also in France. And I know that you have traveled a great deal in France. Um, so how have your personal experiences kind of impacted your writing or brought you to those locations? Well, I, you're right. I have two series and one of them is set in California and it's pretty much based on the kind of work that I used to do for a living. Um, and the things I find fun, that's art and fundraising and hanging out with rich people of which I am not. Um, but the French one uh, was actually inspired by some friends of mine, a, a, an American couple who lived here in Northern California, who decided not on a whim exactly, but because they're whimsical people, they decided to sell everything and move to France. And they didn't have much money. So what they did was to, what he did when she said, I'd love to live in France again someday because she's lived in France before. He got on the computer and he said, here's eight houses we can afford. And they picked one and it was in this tiny rural town and I visited them a number of times. And out of their experiences, as someone was saying, the being the outsiders, in a very small rural hamlet, really, where the old farming family's not wealthy, um, that really, their experiences and what I then played with, with their experiences kind of informed the French novels because we're not talking small town, we're talking hamlet, we're talking a crossroads. And so everybody knows everybody's business, and if they don't, they make it up as they go along. And uh, they're not, they're very hostile to outsiders. And my own um, grasp of the French language, I'm sad to say, is pretty rudimentary. Uh, and so uh, struggling with that, I had a couple of characters who are non-French speakers who struggle with that too. So, but it's all for fun. I mean, you know, so it, it was, it was really fun to write them. And, and I, semi lived them through my friends experiences so um that was that was a real treat for me and an eye opener whereas in here in california with my danny o'rourke series it's my comfort zone i mean i you know I, I i i know how it works and it's fun to write about that and i'm afraid i'm a little cynical maybe sometimes about that but in in the france one it was just um charming i thought and and the people were uh, the people were lovely, the people I met in this tiny little hamlet. So it was fun to write about them. Nice. Um, Sherry, you're a native New Englander, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, you lived with your retired Coast Guard officer husband. And literally, I, I cannot even believe I'm going to say this out loud, how more New England can it get? They live where they can like walk to a lighthouse, right? I mean, is that not like the quintessential New England experience? Um, now you have two series, The Lobster Shack Mysteries, um, and then a new one, which is going to be Ice Cream Shop Mysteries, which is coming out next year, summer 2021. So was it inevitable that you would write about New England? Or, or is that something you came to because 
you know, you, I don't want to say you discarded other ideas, but it was just that's where I think, as Susan was saying, this kind of comfort level, you say, well, this is where the story is for me. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that where I live, um, and no hard feelings, Steph, no worries, you know, about Connecticut, um, is on the other end of the state, very much. Um, Connecticut is a very tiny state, but it's full of lots of really fascinating little corners. Um, and my little corner of the state um, is what we call Mystic Country. The town I write about is Mystic, Connecticut. Um, and at the time I started writing, I was living in this this house um, that we were renting, and it was called, I called it Musty Manor, just this rambling old New England house, and I could look across and see um, the place I ended up writing about, this little village, um, Mystic, where there are lobster shacks. I mean, it was just, when you're in a place like that, you're so inspired um, to bring it to other people. Um, I love this theme we're talking about, about escaping, um, from a place into a place, maybe. Um, my husband's um, career did take us to many places and we moved many times. I can't even keep track of how many times I've moved. Um, but being born in New England and built in New England, um, I never really thought about myself from an outsider's perspective until I moved to uh, the southern part of our country and was viewed as a Yankee. And, you know, it's funny when you start seeing yourself from these different angles. So, um, so when I came back here to Connecticut, um, I, I, did, I did want to write about a character who was a fish out of water. And uh, I think we've all felt that way. So how more fish out of water can you get than an injured ballerina who ends up working at a lobster shack called the Lazy Mermaid? That's kind of channeling how I felt, I think. Um, but yeah, the lighthouse is great. Um, I remember the first time we moved into our new house and I actually heard the foghorn. I didn't realize you get a foghorn with a lighthouse. And I don't think I would have bought the house if I'd known about the foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to it now. It's like when you live near train tracks, it's just background noise, you know. I sailed um, for the first time last year, uh, transatlantic, and when we were leaving, um, we heard the foghorns. It was a very foggy night, and I thought, I don't think I fully had understood what a foghorn was before that. And there were a lot of them <laughs> going off in the harbor in New York, and it was kind of crazy. Um, yes, I, um, you were born in Canada. You live there now. But you have lived for years in the Mexico, in Mexico and in the United States, which of course is a nice range of experiences to work from. Um, yet your Lane Winslow mysteries are set in England and in World War II, right? Uh, uh, well, they're mostly set here in British yes. Columbia. In, yeah. uh, uh, so um, I, I consider myself a little bit bicultural. My parents were both British, That's all populations are British, yeah. and they all live in England, except my brother who lives in a snowy Alberta. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, the, you know, the community where I, my books are set right after the war in 1946, 47. And uh, the community that I lived in as a very small child is just down the road about 15 miles um, and has changed very, very little since my childhood. And it then in those days was populated by um, mostly English people who came here to grow apples and fruit and so on. And, um, you know, it was a, a kind of a real backwater. You know, if you had a tea there, you had a tea like in their English imagination, it was something massive because they were more English than the English, you know, and they kind of stayed the same while in England everything kept moving. And a, a lot of what was around me predated, I mean, I was born in, in uh, 48, I guess I shouldn't be revealing that, uh, but, you know, the community I lived in was uh, deeply anchored in the, almost the pre-war, you know, in the 30s. So, you know, when I began to think about um, writing, I based these books largely on my mother who bought a house there. Um, and I lived in the house that I write about. So it's very close to me. 
Um, and it's a place that I lived in when I was very young and went back and forth to when I was a teenager. But effectively, I was an internationalist like my parents were who lived in Latvia and uh, South Africa and everywhere. Uh, and, you know, we lived in Mexico and Tucson. And in, in this last book, I, I now uh, incorporate that experience of living in Tucson as a teenager um, as part of the, you know, as part of the, there's a murder in each place. So um, that that's kind of how, you know, my background figure, it allows me to go home, you know, that old, you can't go home anymore. Uh, in a way, it, it places me back in a place that I really uh, am full of love for. Yeah, I'd like to, I'm fascinated by the Latvian thing. There's so many conversations here that I'm like, oh, we need to have a little side conversation on that. Um, but I'm fascinated by the idea of, and I think Susan, you put it well, about being familiar with a place and then also an outsider. And um, a lot of you've really touched on that in many different ways. And I, I had that experience. My books are set in Switzerland where I live with my husband. He's Swiss, all his friends and you know his relatives were there, some of his relatives. And they were comfortable in all the languages. I was an American, I was the outsider. In all fairness to my husband's, the Canadian half of his family, um, in general, I am referred to as the American wife, like literally. And they're like, oh, you're the American wife. I'm like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> like, so, okay. So, and again, Sherry, that's like people who move north and south in the United States. You realize you're suddenly a Yankee. You realize you're a Southerner living in Maine or something like that. <laughs> and, um, and then I'm thinking about, I'm working on a book right now set in Kentucky, which is where I grew up, which is a place I'm very familiar with. And so it's really in my comfort zone. So I wonder if each of you could talk about the, the familiar versus um, the unfamiliar. And then I find in my writing that when I'm describing something like Switzerland, which I know very well, but what I also see with the outsider's eyes, and I can see what is intriguing and what is strange you know, to the outsider. But when I'm writing about Kentucky, I have to almost have someone go back and say, but wait a minute, expand on that because it's not familiar to me. So how do you all find that balance between you know, the familiar and, and the external and, and how do you use that in your, in your work? Um, I don't know who wants to give us a go first. Does somebody jump out there? Well, I will jump in because I'm so familiar with the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm familiar with the secondary art market. I'm really familiar with art and involved in the art community. But when I write the Danny books, I really have to step back and remind myself that it isn't always wonderful, that there are, there are things that having been involved in it for a long time, I really do have a sort of jaded eye about. And I think uh, that makes me a bit of an outsider because I don't buy into everything that's kind of part mm -hmm. of that scene. And so for me, maybe a lot of us are like that. Those of us who are writers frequently decide, are, are the kind of people who observe and who are slightly pulled back from buying into everything. And I, I, think, I, I think that gives us a sense of being an outsider a little bit or the ability to step back and look at something and not take it at face value, which is really good if you're writing crime fiction. And so, so for the ones that are more local for me, for the Danny series, I find that that is not a problem. That's the way I, you know, I look at it and I, I, I may make fun of it a little bit about all the things that I see and, and, the, and the attitudes and the posturing and so on. Um, in the French book, I really am an outsider and it's delightful sometimes to be an outsider and to simply have to throw yourself on the mercy of strangers um, which if you travel around the world, you know that. You may not know the language, you may not understand the, arc, the specific parts of language, even if you have the general things, if somebody gets into a discussion of something with a specialized vocabulary, you can still be lost. And sometimes it's a great pleasure to simply acknowledge that you, you don't know and you're open and uh, open to being not just corrected, but to being taught. And people respond to that very nicely, I find, in my travels in, that I've done in many countries, um, that not being defensive about it can open doors and make for much, much more acceptance. And then that kind of rolls into um, more sympathy for people 
and and more i don't know it just it takes the curse off being a stranger for me um, Alice, you use an American set in, in England. Is that part of setting up the tension of the insider-outsider? Alice, you need to take your mute off. <laughs> that has to happen at least once. <laughs> um, I, I was saying I originally had the idea of writing this series while I was on a visit in England. And it was only later that we actually got to live there. And then um, I, I decided to give it a go. I hadn't read, written a mystery before that. But um, for the most part, I write about where I'm not. So there's like a time lag between when I'm living in an experience and when I write about it. Although I did, I did do m the writing of the first book while I was still in living in England, and um, and a lot of the, uh, the sort of fundamental elements of my fictional world there were developed while I was right on the scene. But um, just thinking back, I mean, mostly I write about place. I, I like that distance of memory and the distillation that comes from memory that allows you to uh, pick up the details that really mattered to you and really matter to the characters. So I'm not... Uh, yep. I, Kathy, I think you... Oh, it was an interesting you. point. Sorry, it was an interesting point of, that Alice made there about the distillation that comes from memory, that the time passing can actually help us as writers, I think, do a better job of transporting a reader to a place. Because from my point of view, time allows me to come to terms with what would the the memory highlights, the memory hotspots, if you like, so that you're able to paint with broad brush strokes rather than drilling down to what might become mind-numbingly boring detail. It's to it's to have a light touch in bringing a place to life for a reader. And I, I wanted to take Kate, a working class Welsh woman, to different parts of the world because that's what I did. And I was able to bring my experiences and memories to become Kate's experiences and memories. But she, like all of us, you know, was an outsider as a Welsh woman. Pretty much as soon as you stand set foot outside Wales, you're an outsider, especially if that's into England and, well, especially these days. But even within Wales, there's North and South, and you're always an outsider almost. But for her learning as she went, every place is, whether it's a tiny village or a city or whatever, there are those people who made it. The, the whole place, it's in their bones. They made it what it is. Then you've got the incomers who might have been there for 30 years, but will always be an incomer. Um, and then you've got the, the people who've just moved in because it's so fabulous and they love that lifestyle. And then they try and change it. And then you've got my characters who are visiting and are able to see that tapestry with the, with the as, as Susan said, with the, the eyes of an outsider who isn't necessarily as accepting of everything as an insider might be. And we all write those close circle mysteries, you know, where only a small number of people could have done it. Um, and those people live their lives beyond the pages of the book. And isn't it great that we get to take them to lovely, that we get to make them live in fabulous places. So yeah, distillation, high spots, and that layering and the tapestry of each small town, each big city, each closed environment that we create. I just love reading them and writing them. It's such fun. I wonder if you're going to say something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to say that the dichotomy for me or the, or the tension uh, is the place I have to go is the place that no longer exists. It's the past. Yeah. So I'm now, you know, I'm a real stranger in the past and I'm writing about the people who were my parents' generation. And so what I'm, you know, in a way you're, uh, 
you know, in a way you're sort of, you're looking at artifacts of the past and you're imagining a bit how they were used and so on. Uh, luckily for me, the community that I lived in uh, was all about artifacts still being in use, you know, like a soap saver. If any of you know what a soap saver is, uh, it's an extraordinary little wire mesh thing that you put all your small bits of bar soap in, and then you can push it in the water and make, you know, dish detergent. I, I mean, there was all that sort of thing. Uh, but also just, you know, what I'm channeling a little bit is, uh, you know, the memories of, you know, stories my mother told me or things I knew about my family or that the older people there who were even older than my parents when when we moved there because I was very tiny um, would talk about so you know I'm a real stranger in that past and uh, you know some of the tension for me is just making sure I get it pitch perfect that I'm using language that is not anachronistic, uh, you know, that I'm, you have to be constantly aware of what the world is today and what things happened then that developed into what's going on today. And you can't take your knowledge and go back with it and use it. You can only use what was there. And so I find that, um, you know, a, a source of real interest and, and uh, you know, a little bit of tension. So that definitely goes into my work. Um, Sherry, I was wondering, you, you know, you're a, a, a native of, uh, make, sure I'm, make sure I'm not on mute. Sherry, I was wondering, um, you know, you're a native New Englander, you lived all over the place and you came back and wrote about New England. And so how do you find you're balancing that familiar with the external? Is it, is it about bringing enough of the external in to your situation, um, to what is for you a very, very comfortable setting in many ways, or how are you finding that balance? Yeah, I loved um, he's building on what some of these other ladies have just talked about, especially when Kathy was talking about memories. Um, I think that there's something, um, you know, when we talk about the, you know, that kind of eternal outsider versus insider um, thing that happens, and especially in these small towns that we write about. Um, I think that in talking about memories and things like that, there are these kind of universal um, things that happen too. And um, in a way, you know, we're talking about setting. There are kind of, um, uh, let's think, this sort of um, emotional setting that comes with places also. And, um, you know, it's built on the history of a place and um, what happens when people go there. Uh, for example, I always have, this, this is kind of funny, um, I, I have people, readers write to me and they'll say, you know, oh, I used to go to lobster shacks with my, you know, my grandparents, or, you know, it's a thing you do on vacation. Um, and thank you for bringing that memory back to me. And, you know, it made me think of, you described it so perfectly. It was this place in X and X is not where I'm writing about, but it's another place maybe in New England. Yeah. Um, I, you know, maybe I'm not doing a great job describing my setting, but I think maybe um, I'm managing to somehow connect with that feel that you want a place to have. I, I have this sort of mythical version of mystic Connecticut um, that I expand on in my series. And I think that um, we want to go to this vision of New England that we all have. We all watched Murder, She Wrote. So we know how New England is supposed to feel and how people are supposed to act there. And I feel kind of a responsibility to my readers to bring that to life for them. Um, and sometimes it does trigger memories um, in them. And I think that's really, kind of wonderful. Um, you know, obviously coming back to a place where I grew up, I see the changes, but there are those eternal um, uh, conflicts. You know, I'm, I'm in a place where um, history, you know, is one of the older places in the United States and um, it's also a tourist place. So you have the locals who live here and then you have the tourists who come in. Um, and that's always a, a little source of conflict. Um, so that's good for a writer. Um, Definitely. Um, Stephanie, you already talked a little bit about why you pick Connecticut and how the insider outside are very clear there. And, um, and so I wonder if you want to talk more about that or also uh, for, for all of us as we go forward, when, when people think of the small town, um, do you think they're looking or are you looking as a writer? And, and what do you think readers are interested in? Is it the psychology of the small town or is it the physicality of the small town or is it that magic combination of both? Um, and Stephanie, you were talking about that very specific concrete 
kind of first reason to put your character there, to put Thomas Lynch in Connecticut. But, you know, the, there's also a psychology and a physical nature. And what does it mean? We all, like you say, we think, oh, I know Connecticut. Yeah, um, I think I chose Connecticut because outside New York. It would make sense for him to go there. I chose a small town because I wanted him to be uncomfortable. And I actually chose a fictional small town because I had had it in my mind that I was going to put him in Naugatuck, which is a real place that had a lot going for it. Um, I spoke to a man who was from there, who was gay, who was like, oh yeah, Naugatuck's terrible. <laughs> so it'd be great for your story in these ways. But the problem with Naugatuck was it was just too big. Um, the, police, the police station would have had too many people in it and I wanted a more claustrophobic setting. So I ended up going with a fictional town, which is always a choice as well. Do you choose fictional? Mm -hmm. Do you choose real? There are real pluses and minuses to both. One is that people can't tell you you got stuff wrong because you created it. <laughs> Although as you go on in the series, you can't actually contradict yourself. That's the, one of the minuses is you have to build this place. Like you are in charge of naming every store, everything, streets. Um, you are the creator of history. When was it founded? Why? Um, so Embrace the power. Certainly. Yeah. And then like, the plus from a marketing point is if you pick a real place, like those people might be interested in reading your book. I picked a fictional place. I'm not going to pull those readers because <laughs> there aren't any. Um, so that was a choice that I made as well. What about the rest of you? The, is the psychology of the place what you think brings people into that small town or is it the physical place that you've created, whether it's real or imaginary? Oh, I'm um, Kathy here. I, I, I think it is the melding of the two that's the magic that I try to create. But I've also, with, with the Kate books where each is set in a different country, I want not just the elements of that place, but then I'm allowed to, uh, they're all real places. So she goes to Nice in the south of France, Kelowna in BC wine country, uh, Pacific coastal Mexico, Budapest. But then I'm, I allow myself to create the specifics which are fictional so if, if it's a death at a dinner party i create the guests at the dinner party and the locale of the dinner party in mexico i created an enclave built by expats so there are it, it's the balance between inspiration and invention that i try to get right but in in the cake books i also bring in a different sort of filmic reference for each book as well so the vegas book for example is a bit rat packy but it's it's a very closed environment the claustrophobic environment stephanie was talking about where everybody's locked in one private restaurant but it's a glitzy private restaurant because it's vegas um and it's the balance knowing that as a reader, I'm also a viewer, and I think many of my readers are also viewers. And even if they haven't read all the same books, you referenced Murder, She Wrote, many of us have referenced the same um, visual stimulus. So you've got the Murder, She Wrote, Cabot Cove syndrome, every, everybody's dead. Um, or you've got the Typhoid Mary syndrome. Everywhere that Kate goes, you don't want to go there because people will drop like flies. <laughs> and, and we've also got to get that, that balance right as well. So for me, it's the balance, the place, the people, the psychology, and the touch points of those memory points of, oh, I've been to a place like that, and it was X, Y, Z, and I remember it, I recall it. Give the reader the joy of memory as well as invention. Inspiration and invention. Yeah. Tracy, I was thinking about your question and um, my feeling about uh, my French books is that the physicality of the place creates the psychology when you're in a very limited, tiny little place and you're stuck there as a lot of those old poor farmers are. They're grain farmers. They're not in the glamorous wine country. Um, it creates a kind of uh, we're all together in this feeling. So their psychology comes from living in this, um, I wish I could paint a picture for you that was better, but I mean, they have old stone houses that were built in the 18th century. They have an old stone church that was taken over in the French Revolution and then given back to the commune. The commune is two adjacent villages. And it's in total disrepair because nobody ever goes to the church. So there's a kind of a uh, 
not a beaten down exactly, but there's a really heavy feeling in this hamlet. There's no business. People, the older farmers are there. Their kids don't want to be farmers. They've all left for the larger cities. And that physical place has created a psychology, a very closed in psychology. So it was interesting to hear you say, is it the physical place or the psychology? I see them, to in my case at any rate, I see them totally married. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. If I could just go in, the, the place that I write about is literally, it's not a small town. It's a hamlet, whoever mentioned hamlets. Um, and for me, the advantage, uh, actually my action takes place really along the whole length of this uh, wing of the lake that I'm actually at right now from the you know a town of 5,000 people that was Nelson at the time to the tiny hamlet where my character lives and where the first murder takes place and for me one of the real advantages of that small hamlet and I often get letters saying okay you know the England uh, she goes to England to, to, to do something uh, because she's an ex-spy um, at one point but everybody wanted to get back to the hamlet because because they like the people. And one of the things I think about writing about a small place um, is just having a recurring uh, set of characters who interact with each other and they you know they become very known to the readers and they interact with the the incomer who is my main character Lane Winslow who's come from England to hide out in this tiny little hamlet and um, you know I think you're right the psychology builds up there's some Americans that live there uh, who've been there for many more years than my main character but they will never become part of that community whereas my incoming character because she's English is much more quickly accepted uh, in in that particular environment sort of thing and the other big advantage of the of the I think the small area is my god you can kill people and no one will ever know and you can leave their bodies in the forest and no one will ever find them I mean it's it's fantastic so Sherry, do you think that's true um, with the lobster shack? Uh, can you just leave people dead by the lobster shack and nobody's going to notice? <laughs> this, uh, this is so much fun for a bunch of mystery writers to sit around and talk. You just can't say things like this sitting in a restaurant. People stare at you. You know, <laughs> um, you know I, yeah, you're, um, there are many, many wonderful opportunities for getting rid of people when you live by the water, especially. <laughs> Um, I did have a body that was discovered when some, uh, when my main character, Allie, is helping uh, Bertha Betancourt, the lobster lady of Mystic Bay, on her, uh, her boat, they, they pull up a body um, that, on, on one of the lobster pots. And, um, you know, it's just kind of, kind of fun. Your, your, your setting certainly gives you all these wonderful um, opportunities for um, invention, as you said, Kathy. I just, I love the inspiration plus invention. I think we all have to get tattoos that say that. That's... <laughs> <laughs> my new mantra. <laughs> um, and I want to go to Alice, but I want to add something, which is, um, I, I'm kind of scrolling through the questions. And of course, we always get the Cabot Cove question, which we've addressed a little bit. Um, and, and I think most everyone here has an outlet, uh, you know, another town they go to. Kathy obviously travels very broadly in her books. Um, so, but it comes back to if your setting is in one place, how does that determine the kind of crime that can happen? I mean, you do not have to be, I think if you're in, in the largest of all cities, you can say, well, technically anything could happen. But when you're in a, in a physically or geographically more reduced place or a very specific culture, um, again, my book set in Switzerland, it's not gonna be a drive-by shooting. Any reader would go, well, that's never gonna happen. And, and, and it takes you beyond the, the veil of belief. So just wonder um, if we wanna start with you, Alice, or anybody else wants to talk about the limitations and then also the possibilities of the unique nature of the crimes. Well, I think one of the things that attracts me about writing about my village is that the, I created an ensemble of characters who are ongoing characters. And I really like <clears throat> to have them sort of come for, to the fore and then go back and see people change and grow up and have a real feeling of there is a community there. And um, then, you know, of course the challenge is if there's like one new person in the book, that must be the killer. <laughs> um, so you have to sort of 
massage these things, but I, um, you know, I think only one murder has actually taken place in my village. And so, you know, I figure if it's in another village, like that's not Cabot Cove, you know, that's somewhere else. And so small palette. It's, I do have Oxford um, comes into the story. You know, that's a pretty big city. I mean, there, all of this can be massaged. You, you don't have to go to uh, Mumbai to get to a new location. Uh, it can be within a smaller frame of reference. And what I like about that is, you know, I'm not interested in writing about psycho killers or random crimes. I've I'm really looking at crimes between people who have fairly small number of degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. And so um, that that's what interests me. And uh, so far, you know, I have not written 25 books on this subject, so I haven't uh, exhausted it yet, but um, I have found plenty to work with so far. Yeah, it doesn't all have to be murder either. One of my books was kidnapping, but I will say a real joy of small towns is reading the police blotters. So because I have a cop, what I like to incorporate is actual small crimes. Small town crimes are hilarious. <laughs> They're just good for a laugh. Yeah. So I had um, in idle hands, I had like this person strewing oyster shells that have not decayed completely and they still have meat. So they're oh. attracting maggots oh. and like, that's a crime. That's a um, <laughs> And it's a big source of like, who's throwing the oyster shells, you know? So like the idea of it always has to be murder. It doesn't always have to be murder. That's a Connecticut crime, right? That's a <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's a good point. In one of my books, in one of my French books, well, I don't didn't say too much and give it away, but you're right. It doesn't always have to be murder. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Stephanie, the, um, the crime logs of small towns or of foreign countries or any place you don't live are, are really interesting. Um, it made international news. We did not hear about this crime in Switzerland. We heard about it here. A man went crazy and was running through a village with a chainsaw. Now, the chainsaw was active, which made it a deadly weapon. Um, and the village, it was literally like a hamlet village, chased him into the woods and subdued him. And again, you know, that cannot happen everywhere. And, but for them, it was like, oh yeah, he just went mad and, and had his chainsaw handy. Um, but what about the rest of you? You know, what kind of, what, what makes the small town so appealing? Um, beyond the, you know, I don't want to just, I don't want to downplay nostalgia, but because that is a great connection, but in a, just a quick snapshot, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience again. Um, what, what, what about it, if you had to do like one or two words, says, yes, this is what I love about the small town. Well, I, as someone who started with the Kate Morgan mysteries, which are plot-driven traditional mysteries, each set in a different place, the Typhoid Mary aspect, I've, I've also written the Wise Inquiries agency mysteries, which are all set in and around a Welsh village. And the, those allow me to write character-driven stories, which is picking up on this, the recurring cast of characters. You can keep adding to and enriching the backstories of the characters in that little village. But for me, it's a very different type of reading and a different type of writing. The character-driven story that the small village setting allows for, as opposed to the more pacey, uh, traditional ones. And Christie herself did it. You know, the Poirot stories are very traditional. Not every crime that Miss Marple looked into was in St. Mary Mead. She also traveled. But when we come down to that quintessential village setting, it can be anywhere in the world. It's just the backstory and the interconnectedness of people's lives going back through generations that I think creates fabulous tension. I agree with Kathy. I think that's a really good point. I love doing the French ones because it's a small town. I get to know the people. I want to know what they're doing next. It's fun. Exactly. I have six months between the, the first two. Um, and in the very end of the first one, uh, there's a clue that somebody may be pregnant. Well, six months later, we find yeah. out what's happening with that baby. Yeah. And I actually have as much fun going back and finding out what these people who are going to be together for a long time in this village are up to, how they've gotten to be better friends or whether there are spats between them. 
Is the woman who doesn't speak French now getting better at it? It really is. Um, yeah. It really is fun. It's like having an extended family, only I don't have any crazy uncles. I get to make them all up to my own pleasure. And the readers really love them. I, I, I don't know how many letters I get about my characters, you know, how much they love them. Somebody mentioned having a small place because you have a limited number of police resources. Um, and I think that's another thing. Obviously, in my tiny hamlet, there's, you know, there's no police. But in Nelson, you know, an hour's drive away, uh, there is a very small police station. And those, uh, much to my surprise, over seven books, those uh, police have become extremely important in the story. And, um, you know, people often tell me that my sidekick to the main inspector is their very favorite character. And it reminds them of them when they were young and so on and so forth. So. So, you know, I have two ends of the lake, the little hamlet, and then the town at the end, with two sets of characters who are ongoing and interact with each other through the medium of, you know, Lane Winslow, the, ma the main character. She's kind of the pivot and everything goes around that. And uh, I think that's a big benefit of having a small setting. You know, there's, there's nothing anonymous about it. Um, uh, ladies, 10 minutes left. I've got... Okay. Um, a couple of comments from the audience I want to share. Kathy, uh, everyone loves your accent, so thanks for <laughs> bringing that to us. Well, thank um, you very much. You're very welcome. I'll, I'll hang on to it then. And uh, Stephanie, someone wants to point out that they live, they read the Small Town Police Report, and they pointed out recently that everyone should lock their car doors because a teenager was stealing CDs. I mean, like, thank you, Small Town Police, you know. How does a teenager even have a device to play a yeah. CD? Yeah. <laughs> Um, wasn't a teenager <laughs> <laughs> but and then we do want to circle around and within the 10 minutes and have everyone say what they're working on now but Iona uh, there was a question for you um, an appreciation for your books and the the kind of near history that you're writing uh, certainly there are people alive who remember that time period but you're doing your research and do you have any uh, either authors or resources that you would recommend in terms of research uh you know, each one of my books has really covered an interesting different part of, of the local history. Um, you know, everywhere from Russian spies, which Canada was absolutely awash in after the war, uh, to a very interesting story about Sudetenland refugees. Uh, also, a big feature in Canada, I think not so much in the U.S., is the home children. And these were children who scoop, were scooped off the streets of England and brought here, you know, through orphanages and distributed out to farms and so on. And that's a very interesting ongoing story. So typically what I look for is, uh, is anything to do with those kind of... Uh, things. And very often there'll be one or two uh, resources written by people who actually experienced it. So there was a wonderful book about a man who was one of the first Sudeten refugees to arrive in the Peace River uh, Valley. And uh, a wonderful book by in the 70s about uh, talking to very, very now elderly people who'd come as home children to Canada. And they had little stories that they told. So often it's a very individualistic thing. But the other thing, if you're right Writing anything period, Ngram, N-G-R-A-M, reader, is a fantastic resource. If you're using something that you're not sure someone would have said in 1947, you can just click into Ngram, put the expression in it, and they'll tell you, you know, that expression started in, in the 60s or you know, whatever it is. So you can prevent yourself from, from, from doing these anachronisms that take people away from this history. So those, that's, that's mine. That's great info. Uh, so we're going to do the reverse um, alphabet again and do a quick lightning round of what are you working on now or in the future? Iona, we'll start with you. Oh, okay. Uh, well, this was the book. Sorry, I'm holding up my current book. Um, and I'm writing on, uh, I'm working on its sequel. And I'm here doing research for the book after the one that comes in April uh, um of 2021, which has a lot to do with uh, tiny uh, little uh, one-room school homes, that uh, schoolhouses that were very prominent uh, all over this part of the world. And uh, the one after that will have, I hope, some very in interesting in in Indigenous uh, content. Um, sure, just, uh, not sure, but uh, Iona, real quick, Ingram is E-N-G-R-A-M? Engram, yeah, N-G-R-A-M. 
Okay. I think you just put that and you see a thing and it's already ready for you to just throw your, your expression in and it'll tell you. We had a question in the chat. So Sherry, what are you working on? What's next? Oh, I don't know if Susan was next, but I'll go. Um, what I'm working on, oh, before we go, I just was going to say something I love about small towns are their cemeteries. And this, the, my la the latest Lobster Shack book was inspired by a visit to a cemetery. So that's drawn and buttered. Um, the newest thing I'm working on um, is a new series. The, uh, you mentioned it, The Ice Cream Shot Mysteries. And I just got the cover, so I'm gonna, I'll show you. The title is um, The Rocky Road to Ruin, and it's oh. under my new pen name, Mary Allen. So, isn't it cute? <laughs> okay, everybody can look for Mary Allen um, for the next books. And yes, if I knew how to spell, Susan would have been next. But no. Um, so, Susan, you're next now. <laughs> well, these are the two books in the French series. I don't know if you can see them. Yes. Um, but they're, one is in the summer and one is in the winter. Um, and what I, I'm working on two books now. One is a, a mystery, a, a standalone that I'm having great fun with. And uh, it's kind of comic, um, but I'm not going to say too much about it yet. And the other is a book, uh, if it's a history, it's set in World War II uh, in the United States, in New York City, as a matter of fact. And it builds a little bit on the life that my mother lived, as many, many women did, who found that they, there was plenty of room for them in the professional world when the men went off to Europe, to the war, to be like my father, a war correspondent. Um, the world opened up for them in ways that they, even though they were, had been college educated, um, they had never really thought would be there for them. And it created opportunities and lots of tensions, but it was a very exciting time for women. And I thought I would uh, tackle that at the same time. So I've got two, two projects going, and I'm also going to relaunch the um, Danny O'Rourke series next year, fingers crossed. So I'm looking forward to that. Nice, we're looking forward to it. Stephanie, what are you working on? So this is the last book, um, but I'm working on a different thing. So uh, Sisters in Crime is sponsoring NaNoWriMo. And unlike most years, I will be competing in NaNoWriMo. And because I'm a lunatic, I'm going to be working on two projects because I got to choose between which one I want to work on. So I'm writing sort of a domestic suspense about neighbors where, whose relationship fundamentally breaks down and they start acting badly against each other. And then the other one I'm imagining is a little bit of a neo-noir in which a woman who is slightly sociopathic, but also not wrong, uh, <laughs> starts acting out. Um, I really like what some people consider unlikable women, but I generally consider women whose minds and hearts are in the right place, but who, who behave in a way that terrifies generally men. <laughs> um, Alice, what are you working on? Oh, Alice, you're muted. Uh, I'm working on the sequel to the first two Ellie Kent books. This is exactly the right time of year to begin this series because this starts on October 30th and talks about is set in the fall and this one is set at Christmas and now I'm working on spring and the uh, sort of precipitating interest of the third book is I wanted to write about a murderer who comes out of prison after 15 years and what is it like to live with having committed murder and how do you try to restart your life after something like that. So my Ellie Kent is going to try to help her but she gets very embroiled in things she wasn't expecting. Mm. Nice. Kathy, what are you working on? Well, um, first thing I want to mention is the Wise Inquiries Agency Mysteries have a new publisher for the e-versions and the first two are now out at 99 cents or 99 pence on all the Amazon Kindle platforms. So you can start in a little Welsh village really cheaply. So have a go with those. But in June this year, the ninth... Kathy, you faded a little bit. Pardon? Oh, that's better. 
Uh, the corpse with the crystal skull. Uh, this is set in a resort in Jamaica, and it's full of Bond and Fleming uh, touches and pirates. Captain Henry Morgan, the famous Welsh pirate, of course. And I'm now working on the 10th Kate Morgan mystery, which will be set right in Kate's backyard. It's not going to be a lockdown novel, but it is going to be the closest murder to home that Kate will ever be faced with. And I wanted to tackle that difference of someone who goes somewhere and encounters murder suddenly having it happening mm. on their front doorstep. So a, a slightly different one for Kate. Um, and we're having lots of exciting casting discussions, which I'm bursting about, but I can't say anything. It's so exciting. So <laughs> read, read, read. Thank you all so much. I've just gotten the, uh, the seconds are ticking on the clock to the end of our time together. Thank you for the over 100, many more than 100 people who've joined us on and off. And um, to all of our wonderful authors, hopefully you found uh, new authors, you've reconnected with authors you love and learned a little bit about what you can pre-order from your favorite local bookstore, right? Uh, support independent bookstores. And uh, as a final thing, another, uh, Shout out to everyone who or organized VoucherCon this year, to Darby, who served as our technical host today. Um, thank you all very much. And uh, let's all tune in in 30 minutes to the next panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, guys. thank you very much. Yeah, good moderating. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Bye, -bye folks. Bye. 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 Good to see everybody. Missing you already. <laughs>